Player Piano is Kurt Vonnegut's first novel. He finished the manuscript by November of 1951, hoping for a springtime publication in the following year, but it was delayed until August 18th of 1952. It features a dystopian world in which America has won the Third World War and has entered the Second Industrial Revolution, set in Ilium, New York. Thanks to the efforts of managers and engineers, machines have taken the jobs of most of the population who are destined to either serve in the military or the Reeks and Rex, the Reconstruction or Reclamation Corps. The novel follows two primary characters, Paul Proteus, a disaffected manager with bright prospects that is the son of the former National Industrial Commercial Communications Foodstuffs and Resources Director, a role second in importance to the U.S. Presidency. The other character is Ashav Brapur, who is on a diplomatic visit to seek out whether America's advancements will suit his own country's needs. To begin with, a player piano, in case you don't know, is a self-playing piano where the keys move according to a pattern of holes punched in an unwinding scroll. The keys move up and down, causing the hammers to strike the strings to produce the sound. Before the story begins, the reader will find an interesting epigraph consisting of Matthew 6.28. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The phrase lilies of the field has often been used to satirize the wealthy for their idleness, but in this case it refers to the masses out of a job, living without dignity in the homestead. Although I said before that it is a dystopia, in fact the country presents itself to its citizens as a utopia, no surprise there, where there is no more war or want for food or housing. Yet most citizens below a certain level of intelligence have been rendered useless and pitiable and are treated without dignity. Paul Proteus starts off this story considering the possibility of a third industrial revolution where even human thinking would be completely replaced by machines. He's a cog in the machine himself that doesn't have any need to think and has a lot to live up to. His father, George, was the head of the monopolized economy and everyone expects great things of him as his father achieved in his day. It's made clear early on that the socioeconomic divisions now lie within the intelligence people rather than any other forms of division. Those clever enough are able to continue their studies until they get the required degrees to get jobs that haven't been automated yet. As for everyone else, it's the reeks and wrecks. Paul begins his transformation when he meets with Ed Finnerty, who has quit his job in DC. They decide to visit the homestead where they meet Lasher a minister who leads them to see the injustices of the system that they have profited from. Finnerty begins to side with Lasher when he learns that Lasher is the leader of a rebel group called the Ghost Shirt Society. Paul makes a decision to buy an old farm to live in with his wife, Anita, who hates the idea. As it said, of all the people on the north side of the river, Anita was the only one whose contempt for those in Homestead was laced with an active hatred. She pushes back on this idea and suggests that Paul spend his energies to angle for the job in Pittsburgh that a few other rival engineers are looking to take. Paul meets up with a man named Kroner who wants him to take the position in Pittsburgh as well, but offers it only on the condition that Paul sell out Finnerty and Lasher. While at an annual event at the Meadows, he is fired. Though Paul tries to quit instead, no one takes him seriously. Paul is slurred and slandered as a saboteur and heads over to Homestead where he's kidnapped immediately by the Ghost Shirt Society. They make him their leader and send out letters with his name stating their intentions. Paul is arrested soon after and put on trial on national television to be made an example out of. It comes out during the trial that Paul holds resentments towards his father, likely because so much has been expected of him to measure up to the patriotic man. While on trial, the country riots and cities are taken over before the government is able to take back control. By the end, however, the government is laying siege for the next six months on Ilium, New York, but Paul, Finnerty, and Lasher promise to make something of this area without machines to show what people are truly capable of doing. Meanwhile, our other main character acts as another set of eyes for us to look into this world from an outsider's perspective. While the Shah of Bratpur is looking to see if automizing his country in a similar manner will be suitable, he gives insight into what this reality means. 
As he's going around Ilium, when he notices citizens, he asks Halyard from the Department of State about them. He often calls them Takaru, or slave in his language. This is how the Shah understands the place of the citizens in America, as he recognizes their dignity has been stripped and they're left to do very little to be part of the Reeks and Rex core. Although I think it's not quite appropriate. The name Proteus refers to the first son of Poseidon, with Proteus having a number of possible meanings otherwise. When we first meet Paul, he is an uncritical, dissatisfied managing engineer with little to look forward to as he pets his cat in his office. Once he sees Fenerty playing a player piano with his own hands, he sees a visual metaphor of the capabilities of humanity and what is possible for them to do to take back their dignity. In this case, I believe the name is in reference to Paul's flexibility. While early on he's uncritical, through a series of eye-opening exchanges, he can see the ills of his society and he changes his ways, finally coming to believe in something and stand for it. Unfortunately, this book is largely weighed down by clunky, misused, and inappropriate metaphors. Don't you see, Doctor, said Lasher, the machines are to practically everybody what the white men were to the Indians. People are finding that because of the way the machines are changing the world, more and more of their old values don't apply anymore. People have no choice but to become a second-rate machine themselves, or wards of the machines. While the sentiment of assimilation into an imperial white culture, or in this case machine culture, may apply to both this story and to history, the people in this story were not systematically removed from their land by any means necessary, so... Sure, they've lost their dignity and are looked down upon but are also taken care of well enough to sustain themselves so the slave and native Indian metaphors <laughs> the novel itself is missing a lot of the traditional Vonnegut motifs like breaking the fourth wall having a self-inserted character or using other postmodernist techniques, it still does have some of the dry satirical humor he's well known for. Much of that comes from the exchanges between Paul and Anita's misunderstandings with each other as Paul pulls closer to the homestead while Anita tries to get as far away as possible. It also comes through in the chapters following the Shah of Brapur, though I would say there is a bit of an orientalist angle to these chapters, so I personally again have mixed feelings. The novel never really comes to a conclusion on the relationship between humanity and technology fizzling out to an unsatisfying conclusion. It serves more as a diagnosis than a prescription. If you haven't picked up this book and you're already a fan of Kurt's work, I do believe it will be a great place for you to pick up Vonnegut once again, but otherwise, can't recommend it.